Okay, so um, we want to look at the ways in which modern research and the fact that we're living in the computer age, the digital age, we want to look at how that might affect our study of, you know, history and the literature of the past and just like to show you some of the possibilities that we're, we're beginning to have here. There's a whole, there's a whole new area of uh, humanities research which is called the digital humanities. And it's how we can be using uh, computers and uh, online databases and all those sorts of things to help us develop our understanding of, well, pretty much anything, to be honest. I mean, the world that's around us today, the world of the past, uh, so many different things. So, uh, focusing on uh, how the computer might affect our study of Shakespeare, let's uh, go ahead with this presentation today. Let's just start a lot by looking at the whole idea of digital text and what it makes it possible for us to do. Now this is all going to be fairly, I, I'm hoping that these next five or ten minutes are going to be fairly simple, okay? Um, that it, you'll be saying, yeah, I know this kind of thing. Um, but basically, once we've got the text in a digital format, we can do things that we, we could not easily do in the past. And uh, I'll show you what I mean. Um, well, I think you, you must be aware, I hope you're aware, that it means that we can search for lexical items within a text so that um, we can find all the contexts in which the word revenge is used in Hamlet. We don't need to, uh, you know, go through the book page by page. We can just click a mouse and it'll just show us all those contexts. So, um, you know, if, we're, if we go, uh, you know, on Google, we search for Hamlet and we use the uh, Gutenberg project um, and click on Hamlet, uh, Prince of Denmark there, then we come through to uh, a variety of options for seeing the text. You choose whichever one you prefer. Um, this sort of uh, simple HTML with images or without is usually adequate for most purposes. And, and that's it. You know, we're through... Um, you've got a bit of stuff at the beginning about copyright and you've got stuff at the end about the project. But in the middle there, most of what you've got there is the, the actual text of Hamlet. And, of course, you just click on, on the edit menu and select find, and then you get a, a, a search box. All right, we'll come up. All right, find in page. I'm using Firefox, so it's down at the bottom left there. Uh, if you're using a different program, the search box may be in a different place. Um, find in page, and then put in the search that you want. Let's searching for revenge, all right? And then uh, you get all of the different contexts, okay? That would be the first one. I am bound to hear, so thou to revenge. And they're all going to be like that, highlighted uh, for you, uh, very easy to, to find. And you know, that, that's sort of the basic uh, advantage of digital text over print, or one of the basic advantages. Um, we can also very easily find out how often a particular word is used. Uh, we may be in a program... Um, that, that actually tells us, it says this is number one of 25 uses or something like that, or we might just um, select the, the whole text depending on what sort of program we're using or what, what, um, what our aims are. We might select all the text and copy it, all right, and then just paste it through into a word processing file, all right. Um, and then once you've done that, again, you've got the, the whole text there at your disposal, all right, you just paste it in, and uh, there it is, and again, you can, you can do a search for, uh, if we, if it, it depends what pro word processing program you're using, um, sometimes you can just click on, some programs, more recent ones, you can just click on find, and it'll tell you everything you need to know, but, um, if not, then, then just do replace, um, and you get something like that, all right? 
So then you just put in your words, you put in the one that you want, revenge, and then you're just going to replace it with some nonsense word like ice cream or banana or anything you like, really, um, and then replace them all. Okay, just click on replace all, and it'll tell you, oh, we've made 29 replacements, or we've made 67 replacements, and then you'll know that um, it's changed revenge to ice cream um, 27 times because it occurs 27 times in the text, okay? Um, or else uh, you'll get, as you get on, on this more recent program, you'll just get a list of all the 13 matches, okay? So you, and you can see the context. You just click on each one. So it's very convenient for you. It's a little bit easier to see it in that format than on the internet. So you might choose to do it this way. But basically, you can see each occurrence of any particular expression or word or uh, group of words. So uh, it depends what you know, word processing program you're using. There, it might be a little bit different depending on the version. Uh, but but um, basically, you can see uh, all those examples of any particular item that you're searching for. Uh, and we can learn quite a lot of things like that. For example, did you know that there are 83 occurrences of uh, cognates of love in Hamlet? And the word hate only comes in once? I didn't until I checked it. Okay? Last night, actually. I was putting this together. All right? Um, goodness, I thought. You know, look at that. Uh, there's only uh, one example of the word hate. And all these examples of the word love. Isn't that interesting? Now, I don't know where it takes me, all right, but it's, it's, it gives me a sort of interesting hint, you know, that he seems to be, um, you, you think of it as a play of revenge, a play of hatred, or that sort of thing, but actually the word hate comes in very little. Right? He talks about love much more than hate. Uh, so that might get us thinking, you know, is that a general pattern in, you know, Shakespeare's work? Um, and then that moves us on now to from the sort of simple search of that kind to uh, a little bit more advanced stuff and something called the n-gram. Well, the n-gram is uh, what we get when we start to look not just at one text, but we're looking at a corpus, that is, a range of texts, a body of texts, okay? Uh, such as we might find on a database or on a... Um, yeah, on a, on a much bigger kind of um, scale than a, symbol, a single text. So we could look at the use of words like revenge or love or hate. Uh, we could look at them in relation to all of Shakespeare's texts. Do we find that it's a general pattern that he talks about love much more than hate? Is there an exception in any of his plays? Uh, what's the exception? Looking for patterns and looking for exceptions to the pattern can be a, a really profitable way of going about um, a research project. Okay, so uh, just basically getting some sense of the, the possibilities here. Uh, as I say, we might pick out the pattern that in, in most of his plays he uses the word love more than hate, but, but there's an exceptional one here. What would that tell us? What's different about that play? Okay. So um, you'd have to do the research to get the results, wouldn't you? All right. You might, you might go onto JSTOR or something and find that somebody else has already done the research for you. But to be honest, this is quite an exciting time for, for people like yourselves because you, you have the chance to do this kind of research for yourselves. It, it, most of it hasn't been gone through a hundred times, a thousand times before and been uh, kind of published by so many people. Uh, so you do actually have the chance to, to, to find new ideas for research, all right, by using these kinds of uh, methods. And um, I'm not suggesting that, that this is going to replace traditional research methods, but that it can highlight areas that you might not have noticed before, all right? Um, or that, may, that, that not just that you might not have noticed, but maybe that nobody's noticed. I mean, you can actually come up with something original here. If, you, if you've got enough uh, imagination in your search parameters, you can, you can come up with something and think, oh, I wonder what happens here. You know, nobody's talked about this one. I wonder what goes on, you know, in this case. 
and you can find out a, a tremendous amount. So uh, it's not so much that it replaces traditional research as that it highlights areas that traditional research has not been able to find because we've now got new methods. We can find new kinds of things. We can very easily find that love is mentioned often and hate is scarcely mentioned at all in Hamlet, but th th there are other things that we can find. All right? we, this is just, a, just a, a very simple example. Who knows what you might find by comparing a range of texts, by looking across different texts. Okay? And, uh, yeah, the way that this information is represented, the way that it's uh, shown is, is typically through a kind of graph. And that, that graph is called an n-gram. And that's what uh, Google has made available. Um, but unfortunately, we can't use the Google n-gram because it only goes back to 1800. But basically... Uh, it, it's, it looks like this. All you've got to do is search for n-gram, okay? So, uh, at the top there you can see searching for n-gram, and it comes up n-gram viewer. So, all you've got to do is click on the n-gram viewer. Alright, so that's the first thing you need to do, and you can find n-gram. Um, as I say, we can't use n-gram particularly for our early modern research, but this opens up what engram is, it explains the idea to you. So uh, we'll start from here. Basically, it goes through the whole corpus of Google Books, which, as you know, is a huge number of books, uh, and it's very easy to use, but, uh, as I say, it only goes back to 1800. So using that, we could see things over the last couple of hundred years. We could see, for example, the pattern of references to Shakespeare's major tragedies. All right? How often, over the last 200 years, have people referred to uh, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, and King Lear? I mean, how, how often have they cropped up in, in published works? And uh, we, we find um, very quickly... OK, can you see how at the top there, um, up at the top, I've got uh, the Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, Othello, each separated by a comma. And uh, it's searched for each one of those. And it's found that, like, up until about 1840, there wasn't all that much difference between uh, Macbeth and Hamlet in terms of their uh, relative popularity, how often writers referred to them. In fact, um, Macbeth was more popular, more works published that talked about Macbeth um, in the early part there. Um, and uh, it's only from about 1850 onwards that you start to get a um, clear difference here that uh, Hamlet, ever since those days, has been clearly far more popular than Macbeth. There have been a lot more references to, to Hamlet. Okay, so you. Whereas Othello and King Lear have always remained less popular, less referred to in publications. It's, it's a very simple piece of information, um, but you can see it laid out there very clearly for you. You can also click on um, particular dates. Uh, I haven't included that in this representation, but you can click on particular dates and see the actual books. All right, It's not just a graph. You can see the books themselves. All right, And you can check those books. What do they say about Hamlet? What do they say about Macbeth? You can go through. And that's what I'm saying here. You would want to go through those books. Maybe not all of them, but you'd want to pick out a, a certain number because it's not just about statistics. It has to be about literature. But this can guide you towards which particular literature do you want to look at. Okay? So... Before we go any further, I do want to say that there are a lot of problems connected with n-grams, and that people uh, think it's a sort of answer to everything, or, oh, I can just you know, easily do some research here and just throw down some statistics. But, but please, you know, be very careful if you do go into this area, 
because uh, you have to really understand how statistics work. Um, we are uh, in 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 uh, in English um, very cynical of uh, uh, very cynical about statistics. Uh, we have this saying that there are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics. And the meaning there is that you know. The damn lies are worse than the ordinary lies, okay, there are lies, and then there are damn lies, which are worse, and then there are statistics, which are even worse, okay? <laughs> but with statistics, you can prove anything, okay? And it, but it's, it's fake. You can't trust it. You have to be very, very careful when you're dealing with statistics that what you're doing is honest and really proves what you think it proves, all right? You have to be really careful. Um, it, so uh, don't don't just jump into a conclusion just from uh, an n-gram result. Okay, uh, you you need to think about the implications. You need to look at the works case by case and start to build up a, a clear picture of uh, of the actual you know literature itself. Um, so that, for example, the n-gram just gives the percentage of occurrences in relation to the total number of texts. Okay, and, and we see that we saw back there that Hamlet, you know, it, it, it grew in popularity, but but in recent times it's been going down again in popularity, apparently. But it may not be that it's going down in popularity. It may just be that there are lots and lots of new types of text, so that uh, the number of works that are talking about Hamlet may be still be. Uh, very high, but there are more texts that are on completely different subjects, like scientific subjects, that of course never mention Hamlet. And therefore, uh, it looks as if the popularity is going down, but it, it may not uh, it, it exactly uh, be going down, only in the sense that uh, a lot of other types of texts have got bigger. So um, it may not be that Hamlet's losing popularity. It may just be that there are more texts of a completely different type that are being published, like scientific works, which would, of course, not mention Hamlet. Okay? So uh, you can't just simply say, oh, Hamlet is less popular now because the, the engram shows uh, the, the, the percentage going down. All right? it, it's more complicated than that. And uh, if you want to... Um, develop this kind of research, I would strongly recommend you to go to one or two websites uh, that will warn you about the dangers. And this is a good one uh, on the pitfalls of using n-gram to study language. Uh, if you just Google for that expression, the pitfalls of using Google n-gram to study language, or it, um, I'll give you the link on my web page. You can just click on that link and it'll take you through to a page. It'll tell you be careful about this, be careful about this, be careful about this. Uh, these results may not be showing what you think. Okay? So uh, you can get some incredibly interesting results, but you need to be careful because uh, it may not be showing what you think it's showing. Okay. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to get really uh, technical, and I'm going to get into something called EBO TCP. I'll explain what that means in a minute. But this is, if you're interested in the early modern period and you're interested in uh, studying its literature, this is uh, a, a fantastic resource. Um, it, what it means is Early English Books Online Text Creation Program. EBO, Early English Books Online, and then TCP, Text Creation Program. And basically what this has is a, a huge number, thousands and thousands, I think a total at the moment of about 50,000 texts from the early modern period, which is a very large percentage of the total number. And uh, it's, it's got problems, we'll be looking at some of the problems, but it is a fantastic resource uh, to get you to understand how much different literature there was uh, at the time of Shakespeare and what they were writing about, what they were saying, what they were uh, doing at the time that Shakespeare was writing. Because I think very easily we just think that Shakespeare was there by himself and, and not get much sense of all the other people who were writing 
around him. Okay? So, uh, basically, we search for it like this. Can you see um, at the top there in the search box I put EBO TCP and it comes up. We get several results and the one that I would like you to use would be this one here. Okay? Early English Books Online um, using the University of Michigan portal. So, you can see on the URL U Mich. Okay? University of Michigan. Okay? If you go in through that portal, uh, you'll come through to something that looks like this. Okay? And then, uh, once you get through to that, you will do what's called a Boolean search. Uh, that means a search using AND, OR, and NOT. There are different types of searches, and you can do those different searches. You can experiment for yourself. But this is the, the, the most useful type of search for us at the moment. Uh, I'm going to look for items that have revenge. And if you remember, in early modern spelling, spelling they have it with a U rather than a V. So I'm going to start off by looking for revenge. I'm, I'm using this little wild card here, uh, this asterisk here. Uh, that means R-E-V-E-N-G and then any other letter. Okay, it could be I for revenging. It could be I, you know, I-N-G. It could be uh, E-D, revenged. Okay, uh, it could be a revengeful. Okay, so anything after the, but the, the first uh, six letters are R E V E N G. Okay, and then after that, anything, anything, you know, just free, wild card. Uh, or, of course, following early modern spelling using the U rather than the V. Okay, and uh, I'm going to try and search like that, and I'm also. Uh, I'm also looking for tragedy, so I'm putting tragic, and again I'm putting that uh, little wild card because it could be IE or it could be Y, okay, early modern spelling, uh, there are different possibilities, and, and this database uses early modern spellings, okay, all the, all the original spellings of the text are in the, in the database. So I'd have to search like that, but as soon as I searched, what happened was uh, I got a problem. I got too many results. This is, this is one of the weaknesses of this um, database, this uh, corpus. We end up with sort not available, result set too large. I have to get my result set under a thousand. If I get more than a thousand results, it won't sort them out into, for example, uh, which, which was published first and second, you know, during their um, period, when was the first, you know, during the year of publication, going through in, in, in that way, uh, or any other way of sorting the material, it's just random results. Um, 7,000 random results, which I've got there, well, sorry, no, not 7,000, what have I got? I've got 4,685, okay? If you take a look here, I've got all these results, I can't go through all of those, especially since they're random. I need to cut it down to something that I can manage. So that's one of the weaknesses of this database. It's, it, it's got um, the possibility that if you get too many results, uh, it won't sort them for you. And you can't limit it by searching, well, just between these years, okay? No, it won't give you that. It gives you for the whole period. So uh, it's a little bit of a badly designed search box, unfortunately. Uh, so, okay, then I find that... Um, if I search like this, if I search inside drama, and I just look for revenge with the U, uh, it's going to give me the right number or a suitable number of results. Uh, I, I chose the U one because uh, that was the spelling that was mostly used in Shakespeare's day. So it's going to it's going to give me results that go, come from the 16th century rather than from the 17th. I'll get mostly results from Shakespeare's time or before. So I'm going to search like that. And I, I'm going to get now uh, 487 records, all right? Uh, 2,737 matches, but 487 texts, all right? So uh, 487 texts takes me under, under the 1,000 that I need for me to be able to sort the results, okay? Sort the results. Uh, that's uh, now uh, an option for me. So, I want to sort them 
by year, okay, and then look at the period when Hamlet was written. That's what I would, that was what I imagined I would do. I thought that would be a you know, useful exercise. Let's see what other people were writing about revenge in other dramas at around that sort of time. Okay? That, and this database would help me define those, those dramas, those texts. And so what do I get? I, I search for data sending, meaning it'll start with the earliest one and move forward to the, to the latest ones. And uh, first thing I notice, the, first, the very first result that comes up, result number one, uh, is um, published in uh, 1530. So quite a long time before Hamlet, okay? Uh, Mm, 34 years before he was even born. And uh, as I go through those results, I find there are about 200 dramas that mention revenge uh, around the time that uh, Hamlet, by, by the time that Hamlet was written, around 1600. There are about 200 uh, dramas that mention revenge. Okay, before that. All right, so uh, 1600, all right, that's about the time that Hamlet was written. We're not exactly sure, but round about that time. And we're up to, um, we're up to, uh, that, that will be result number 200 there. That one at the bottom is the 200th result, okay? So uh, that's about 200 works that are referring to revenge by the time Hamlet comes along. But, you know, this database was going to tell us an awful lot more than that. Because, let's go back to that first one, okay? The, the 1530, the, f the first mention of revenge in a, a dramatic kind of context. Uh, and we look at the results details, okay? We can click on results details. What are we going to see? Well, uh, we're going to see the actual context. Okay, this is the this is the sentence. Okay, da, 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 da. if he be meek, and meek, mild, and sober, thou art sorry, for he not revenged each hurt and injury, and if he be hard, then dreadest thou danger. Okay, basically, just even from looking at that little bit, I can see. Hello. He not revenged. Okay, it's about somebody who doesn't take revenge. All right. He does not revenge. He not revengeth in early modern English. Okay? So uh, I'm thinking, oh, well, that's not really what I was looking for. But you see, the database can help me already to know if that text is something that, that is going to be interesting to me. I'm deciding, no, I'm, that doesn't seem to be what I'm interested in. That's about somebody who doesn't take revenge. All right? So, uh, okay. What about the tragedies that, that do talk about revenge? When did they start to get published? And I start going through the results, and the first one that looks uh, possible is actually a translation by the Roman writer Seneca. Well, actually, Seneca was a very famous writer of kind of bloody tragedies. So um, it's not surprising, really, that uh, Seneca comes up pretty quickly in this list. In fact, most of the English dramatists were... Um, copying Seneca, in a way, or the influence by Seneca. So once, once this translation comes along, that's going to be a very important thing that uh, kind of starts off a fashion for this kind of tragedy. So this would be the first one. Um, and uh, it was, uh, you can see the date, 1559. All right? Uh, five years before Shakespeare was born, uh, they started... Uh, translating Latin tragedies that were very bloody and full of revenge. And uh, this time, okay, last time we looked at the results details, this time let's take a look at the table of contents and see what that offers us. Uh, we can, first of all, we can see a detailed list of the contents of the work, as you'd expect. But it's also going to give us a chance to see the whole text. The whole text. All of it. Let's see. 
table of contents. And it's going to start off looking like that, all right? The author, the title, publication, uh, information, um, print source, okay? It gives you, you know, an, uh, all of the sort of basic bibliographic information that you need. All right? And then, after we get that bibliographical information, we get the table of contents together with an option to view the entire text. Like this. Okay, there's the table of contents, and you can see up on the top right corner there, view entire text. You can see the whole of this text. Now, firstly, Project Gutenberg that we saw at the beginning to, to get the Hamlet text, <clears throat> It doesn't have thousands and thousands and thousands of texts like, like this database does. And anyway, even if it does, it doesn't have an index that you can easily find it from in the way that this database has. This database will make it possible for you to find the text that you want and uh, it, it's also got the full text on the database. So this is a wonderful resource, a wonderful opportunity if you're really interested in developing your understanding of Shakespeare's period. Well, when you click on it, it'll give you a message saying uh, it may take a long time to download. It's, it's like they're kind of all, almost trying to put you off. But actually, uh, it doesn't usually take very long. So just ignore that and click on it and say, yes, come on, just download it for me. All right? So you can see it says view entire text now uh, up there. Just click on that and you're away. All right? And you get, all right, you, you click on the view entire text and you're going to get uh, the whole text, just as we had, um, you know, the, the Project Gutenberg Hamlet, you're going to get the whole text of this play by Seneca. Okay? And there it is, okay? Uh, it, it, the sixth tragedy of the most grave and prudent author, okay? And it just gives you the whole text all the way through. Um, We've got some disadvantages, and I've still got to explain one or two more disadvantages, but can you see that basically uh, what we've got here? Uh, we can play around with the entire text of Hamlet on Project Gutenberg, and we can play around with the entire text of Seneca, or hundreds and hundreds, thousands of other uh, early modern texts using the EBO database, this Early English Books Online database. Okay, so uh, we have got a few little drawbacks that you might have been noticing as we go along. Let me just go through some of the you know, drawbacks of the database. Uh, firstly, um, the search parameters are a bit limited and you end up, uh, you, you can't just choose to search for a few years or something like that. You don't have, you don't have so many options in the search box. And if you get too many results, uh, you, you can't sort them in any way, which is a problem. Then you've got, um, yeah, uh, then you've got uh, the, the fact that there are actually two corpuses, but we can only get full access to one of them. So uh, the one that we can see has got something like 20,000 texts to it. The other one is a bit bigger, and we can't access that. It will become public later on. But for us at the moment, uh, you know, you, you, you have to pay for it. And at the moment, Sophia is not, uh, and most Japanese universities are not members. Uh, probably by this time next year, we will have it. But at the moment, we don't. Okay, so if you're thinking of carrying on, uh, just gabangshite kudasai, by this time next year, uh, you may have full access to this. So, otanoshimi ni shite kudasai. I don't know if that's an exactly an appropriate way to put it, but uh, uh, it, will be, it will probably be available for you within maybe even before the end of this year. Um, so we don't have that at the moment. Um, and the, num the page numbering system, okay, when I say a different numbering system, there what I mean is a different page numbering system, and uh, 
the, the database doesn't show the page numbers. You may have noticed the one that we just saw, the Seneca. It said page unnumbered, page unnumbered, page unnumbered. Um, actually, there is a way to find out the number of those pages, but uh, it, it, it's not shown on the database because it's a different system. Now it's very simple. A book says page one, page two, page three. Simple. But in the old days, they didn't have it so simple. All right, uh, we, can expl we can talk about that perhaps if you're interested later on, but um, they, they didn't put the page number in the modern way and the database uh, doesn't catch that. So it's a little bit difficult because you can't easily say what page the information is, or, you know, that you can't say what the page is very easily. Um, and also, as we noticed, it's using early modern spellings, which means that you have to put in, you have to think of all the different possible spellings that there might have been from that time, which is another difficulty. Still, though, basically, you've got a huge resource there that uh, I think, you know, probably very few people seem to know about. Um, but if you're interested in this period, this will give you access to almost everything that was written in Shakespeare's day. Okay?